welcome to Lo-Fi 12, our one-year anniversary edition of our local first meetups. I am incredibly grateful for all the wonderful community members and for the amazing speakers coming up today. This wouldn't be local first one year anniversary without James. So what we have is a remote message from him because he's unable to make it since he's too busy being a pirate captain. And uh, we'll just hear from him for a second. Hi, everyone. I'm James. I'm very sorry not to be able to join you live. Uh, but I'm busy being local first this week, uh, well, local only, really, uh, on my boat, sailing uh, without, unfortunately, any connectivity. Uh, so I thought I would pre-record this video just so I had a chance to, to say hi to everyone and take part in this very special meetup. My personal local first journey started about two years ago. Uh, I launched an open source project called TinyBase, uh, which is a reactive data store for web applications. But just a few weeks later, I saw what is now um, the famous essay by Jeffrey, Johannes and others about Riffle, uh, which is their reactive relational database for local first apps. And something clicked and I realized that I wasn't alone in thinking about this alternative path for fast and modern web applications. And in fact, it turns out there was a lot of work that was happening around the web. Uh, people had similar ideas and were trying to put this uh, kind of concept together. But I will say at the time, there wasn't a lot of structured information about how to build these apps. Um, so I took it upon myself to gather some links and some documents and some essays and some videos, and I put them all together into a website for other folks uh, to, to read. And localfirstweb.dev was born. So to be clear, my contribution was very humble, just a little bit of HTML, really. Um, uh, but it was Jonathan who really saw the potential of this nascent idea and poured his heart and soul into it, taking on the site, launching the Discord, the reading groups, uh, and of course, running these meetups. Uh, it has been truly staggering to see how fast this community has grown and how much interest it has been getting from developers around the world. Um, people who are looking for new ideas, new ways to build things. And to change the world, you truly need a movement. Uh, and the momentum of this movement looks absolutely strong enough to be able to do so. But more than anything, it's been truly humbling to see the contributions that Jonathan himself has made. Uh, and really, all I want to say at this point, uh, and I hope you will all join me in saying so too, is thank you, thank you, thank you, Jonathan, for everything you've done for this community and long may it continue. Uh, and with that, I'm going to get back to sailing. And again, I hope you all enjoy this very, very special meetup. Take care. He had me gushing a bit. Uh, but anyways, young James, and uh, he really wishes he could have been here. To, but we'll try to do our best to make do without him. So on today's agenda, we have, like I said, a fantastic set of speakers. But I'm personally very excited for Martin Kleppman's talk today. Uh, a little bit of an anecdote that I shared on uh, Hacker News when our announcement post hit front page is that Hacker News, uh, Martin Kleppman's book, Data Intensive Applications, was the only reason I didn't bomb my LinkedIn interview because I thought I knew web application development, but there's a whole difference between that and planet scale web app development. So if you haven't read the book, that's Hello. Uh Slides are showing up, right? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Well, yes, it's very exciting to be here. Thank you for coming along. Um, I guess the th first thing I will mention before I get started with my talk is that there's a local first conference happening soon uh, at the end of May in Berlin. And this is just being announced today. Uh, you can find the details at localfirstconf.com. Uh, I took absolutely no credit for this. I'm not involved in organizing it. It's a couple of members from the community. Uh, doing the organizing, and so I'm really grateful to them for putting together this this in-person event. Uh, I will be speaking there, so 
uh, you can meet me there in person if you like, and several others from the community as well. Anyway, so to get on to the talk, um, I thought to talk a bit about sort of the background story of where Local First came from, but also where I think it's heading in the future. And so the my personal background story behind this is like, the year is 2013, uh, I'm at LinkedIn, which bought my previous startup. Um, my project just got cancelled though, and I'm just feeling like a general malaise about the state of the, the tech industry and the way we build web apps. Like I felt it's, it's like very inefficient the way we're doing it. We're building all these server backends and then we have to be on 24 seven on call rotations to babysit those bloody servers. Um, and we're like centralizing all of this data in, in our big databases and essentially taking away the control from the users. And I was just, I couldn't quite articulate it, but I was unhappy with it. Uh, and I came across this uh, paper from Mark Shapiro and others, which had just come out two years previously or so, uh, explaining CRDTs. And I thought, well, this is interesting. This seems like potentially a technical, technical way that we have for making ourselves less dependent on all of these centralized servers. And so then over the coming years, I started actually experimenting with this, like I wrote a basic uh, CRDT implementation initially in Ruby of all languages, um, but that was the language I knew best at the time, so why not? Um, then uh, 2017 or so, then I started the AutoMerge project to get, to get together with uh, Ink and Switch, uh, which started off implemented in JavaScript, but then we later rewrote it in Rust. Um, and about 2019 or so, we felt like, okay, we're, we're kind of onto something. We should try and articulate the, these values we're trying to implement in software. You know, we started with the software and the algorithms, but really there were a set of values behind it that we hadn't really explained very well. And so we thought, well, we need some kind of term for expressing, like some sort of adjective for saying, I'm building an X app in order to, where X somehow encapsulates this idea of, of the type of app we're trying to build. And so we picked the term local first, we wrote it up as an essay. Um, and then, as you can see, it took another couple of years before actually a community started forming around it. Um, but anyway, that's, that's like the story of where the term came from. And so maybe this is a good opportunity to clarify a little bit what I think about when I mean local first, because the term offline first had existed for several years prior to us uh, coining local first. And obviously we were familiar with that term and we initially wanted to just use it, but we felt it didn't capture everything that we wanted. Um, this idea that the, so that the software works without an interconnection is it's important, it's an important part of local first, but it's not really the core idea. Um, also like using CRDTs, you know, it's, it's a technology, it's kind of incidental, really, it, that's not really the core thing uh, behind local first either. Also like whether it uses cloud services or whether it's peer to peer, again, it's, it's not really the primary thing. Um, in the local first essay, we try to articulate these seven ideals, which sort of explain the goals and properties that local first software can have. Um, and you've probably read those, so I won't reiterate them. Um, but that was like our first attempt. And I think now we're starting to further understand it. And actually, we're starting to be able to explain even better what the core is of local first that we actually want. Um, so for that, maybe we can travel even further back in time to 1987 and Leslie Lamport, um, who you might know is one of the legends of distributed systems research. Um, he uh, was annoyed with the systems, the distributed systems that he was working with at the time. And he wrote in a grumpy email that a distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't even know existed can render your own computer unusable. Um, and so I would say, well, this is not really a characteristic of a distributed system. It's a characteristic of a badly designed distributed system. And one way we could formulate local first is we say that it overcomes this problem of Lamport. In local first software, the failure of a computer that you didn't know existed should never prevent you from working. So you should always be able to continue working on your local device but also, of course, be able to uh, share and collaborate with other devices. So that idea of being able to work offline and this idea of, of local first, uh, sorry, the idea of offline first is a requirement of local first. So I would say that uh, 
if you have a local first app, then it's, it must work offline, but it's not necessarily true in the other direction. If you have a work, an app that works offline, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's local first. So what else would it mean for something to be local first? Well, also, it needs to be collaborative, you know, or at least multi-device. So if it's local only, I would not sort of call it local first either. Um, but moreover, maybe the most salient part of local first is if, it, if the app stops working when the company that made the app goes out of business and shuts down all of their servers, then it's not local first. The so local first encodes somehow this idea that the users must be able to take control of their data and not have that data held hostage by some company that might go out of business. So having the data only stored on that on one company's servers is just out of the question. That, that cannot be local first. Um, it's a bit better if you have maybe an open source server, which then at least you could migrate to your own self-hosted server. But, you know, running your own server is kind of a, a chore as well. And for many people don't have either the skills or the inclination to run their own servers. Um, a lot of people suggest peer-to-peer, -peer, and that's kind of more promising, but it always has these problems of it doesn't work when all of the nodes are offline. And moreover, there are all these problems with NAT traversal and firewalls and so on. Getting peer-to-peer -to, -peer to work reliably is, is just pretty hard. Um, so really, there, I think there are other technical architectures that are possible which enable this kind of uh, this goal, this vision of local first. So let me put it this way. Imagine a future in which on your device you've got several local first apps, maybe a local first spreadsheet, a local first graphics app, a local first uh, Kanban board, whatever, a whole bunch of, of those apps. And now, well, how do those apps synchronize from one device to another? Like, basically, I don't care how that synchronization works, okay? I, I just like want my data to appear on all of my devices and how that's implemented is, is really irrelevant. And in particular, I don't really want any of the cleverness of any of the application logic to live on any servers anyway, because I want the app to work locally on my own device, which means all of the interesting logic of the app has to be in the client side uh, anyway. And so really, like, the synchronization procedure is, is, should just be irrelevant. Now, how would you actually build this? Well, if you're sort of born and raised in the web development sort of uh, mindset, well, you would probably build a syncing service for your own app, okay? You would build a backend, you would hire a backend team, and you would set up a syncing service to, for your spreadsheet app or for your graphics app. And that's what web apps have been doing for decades, and let's not do this. This is, this is terrible, and it's, uh, we really don't want everybody to have to build their own backends. What I think Local First enables is that actually, we just, because all of the clever stuff lives uh, client-side anyway, the syncing service can be very generic and very simple and just do the bare minimum necessary to shuffle some bytes from one device to another, basically. So this, uh, we can then have a single generic syncing service that can be hooked into many different types of apps. Many different uh, types of local first apps can then use the same service as their syncing uh, backend. Uh, we can make the protocols for the syncing service open standards and independent of any particular app so that any type of app can use it. And uh, this is now very, very valuable because it means, you know, rather than just having one service, you could also imagine, for example, AWS hypothetically in the future runs one of these syncing services for local first software. But if you don't like it, if it gets too expensive, if they change the terms of service, if they lock you out, whatever just switch to Azure's hypothetical future syncing service. And they will charge you a few cents per gigabyte, just like AWS charges you a few cents per gigabyte. And this would be a wonderful future in which you can very easily switch from one syncing service to another for each app. And the app developers don't even need to care which syncing service you're using because it's just uh, abstracted anyway. And the syncing service from different vendors are interoperable with each other because they speak the same protocol. And moreover, now it makes sense to have peer-to-peer -peer as part of the mix because peer-to-peer -peer can do some certain things that cloud services can't. So for example, if I'm in a rural location, I've got my laptop and my phone right next to each other, but I don't have internet connection on either, I should be able to just sync between my two devices locally, right? It doesn't make sense that everything has to go over the internet via AWS US East 1 in Virginia. So we want to have peer-to-peer -peer as part of the mix, but we can't rely on peer-to-peer -peer as the only syncing protocol because it's just too unreliable. And so having 
both cloud and peer-to-peer -peer in the mix of syncing options really seems like the best way forward here. So this is great for users. Uh, you know, it's, it's great for users if they can switch out one syncing service for another, um, because yes, if one provider goes bust, then that's fine, just switch to a different one, uh, no problem at all. But crucially, I think it's better for developers as well, because if you don't have to build your own backend, you know, in, a, in this sort of local first world, it would become in, it would be insanity to write your own backend because why would you? It would be like writing your own Postgres. Who would write your own Postgres if you want to build an app? No, you just take Postgres off the shelf and use the existing thing. You know, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. And likewise, for a syncing service for local first software, there should be no need to reinvent the wheel and uh, and build your own syncing service. So. That means you just don't need a backend team. You don't need people to be on 24 seven on-call rotation pager duty because somebody else is dealing with that. Somebody else's problem. This is wonderful. So that means now smaller teams can build the apps uh, with smaller amounts of money required, which means now that actually it becomes viable for more niche apps to be built by smaller teams. So you can have uh, niche apps that really satisfy the needs of a very particular target audience but very well, and they can still be economically viable um, because it's required less money to build the app in the first place. And so this is powerful because it, it changes the entire economics of app development. Uh, it changes the, what is possible and what is not in economic terms. And the technology is just an enabler for all of this. Um, but the, the really impact, the big impact from this uh, stuff happens because the, uh, because the economics change. And so, uh, yes, so I think sort of peer-to-peer -peer is, is part of the mix, but, um, but not the only thing. I think we will still need these cloud services. In terms of te the technology that we can use to um, build all of these things, so um, I've been working on this uh, CRDT implementation called AutoMerge for a couple of years now. Um, but of course, lots of other people are building other um, local first library systems, protocols, product, pro products, etc. And uh, that's a good thing. I think it's, it's really important that we have this ecosystem of lots of people different, building different types of tools for different types of apps, um, because it's very new stuff. You know, we, we don't know yet what is going to work and what is not going to work. Um, I think eventually we want to head down this path of standard, having open standards for the data synchronization protocol. Um, but right now, I think it's still too early because we, we don't know what the right protocol is yet. Um, you know, once we do reach the point of uh, wanting to standardize these things, um, then I would submit the AutoMerge sync protocol as one of the proposals, and other people will su submit their sync protocols as other proposals. And then we all go to the IETF or somewhere like that and, and hash it out and figure out what, what, what it is that we all want together. Um, so right now, I think we're kind of in the expansion phase of experimentation. We want lots of people doing different experiments, trying things out, figuring out what, out what works and what doesn't. Um, and that way, then we all as a community then uh, figure out exactly what, what we actually need uh, for this infrastructure for local first. Um, so, as I mentioned at the start, I think CRDTs are, are an interesting technology because they solve kind of an inherent problem that Local First has. So, in Local First, I think it's inherent that uh, if you can edit the data on your own device locally uh, while you're offline, that means that inevitably different people on different devices will make edits independently of each other. And so, those edits will have to get merged together somehow. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a CRDT. Um, but it's almost the definition of a CRDT, really, is, is that it's an algorithm that can take these uh, independently made edits and merge them together. Um, but most fundamentally, the point I want to get across is that really Local First is this set of principles and values centered around the idea that you should never be blocked from doing your work uh, by being by the failure of some remote service or by being locked out of some remote service. And this, I, this principle and this value that's bigger than any particular technology, any particular implementation, um, that's really the, the core thing that I'd like this community to rally around. So that's really all I wanted to say. Um, here are a few links, but you've probably seen most of those already. So I will just leave it at that. And thank you very much.
amazing morning and this is why we get excited and fired up it's not it's so much more than just the technology stack and i can't tell you how much i fume when somebody says like i have internet everywhere why do i need local first it's just like ah if only you got the vision for a better future that we all envision together uh thank you so much martin and uh up next we have one of those implementations and we switched up the order a little bit uh, sam and james will be going up next and if you haven't heard of electric sql where have you been hiding it's an amazing stack that has been released and they're just coming at this problem really fast with like beautiful solutions and they have this thing called collapsing the stack that just really hit home for me uh without further ado james why don't you take it away thank, thank you So I, I guess when Martin, that was such a cool talk. So look, thanks so much. And I, I guess when Martin talked a bit about um, kind of where local first came from and the sort of principles behind it, uh, what I wanted to talk about with this talk is a little bit about what it fits into in terms of the evolving software landscape. So, and I'm going to talk particularly from our viewpoint at Electric, kind of some of the stuff sort of we're seeing kind of through what we're doing. Um, so, so just for a little bit of context on that, um, so Electric is an open source platform for building local first software. Um, we provide a local first sync engine. Um, it's based on a protocol that we came up with called the Satellite Protocol. It's open source. We can we can see whether it's the right one going forward. Um, and then we try to build a programming model around that that solves the concurrency challenges with local first in a way that is dropping compatible with existing relational systems and particularly postgres so we're sort of trying to make it a uh, viable for normal teams and normal companies who've maybe built stuff previously that's based on postgres to then migrate those apps to a local first architecture uh, and so you know, our, our mission for the company we're trying to change the way that nearly all software is built in the future from what we have today is these sort of cloud first kind of web service API systems to local first software architecture. And so like, because of that, I, I spend a lot of my time talking to people about why local first is better architecture, why it's the future of software. Um, and I sort of point out a lot of the obvious stuff that I think a lot of us know here. And I tend to focus on the quality of the UX. So we talk about how apps built local first are just super snappy and instant. We talk about how you have real-time collaboration built directly into the product through the background sync. And we talk about how apps are just super reliable. Like they work when the network is down, they work when the back end is down. Um, and practically as well, they like maintain a high quality of user experience even across like patchy connectivity. And I also talk about the developer experience. So a bit like Jons was just saying, there's a sort of concept of like, if you look at the stack for building applications on say web services, you have all these layers of like uh, serialization and validation and authorization and sort of hydration and caching and stuff where, uh, whereas with local first, you can collapse that to just your components and your data. So, you can simplify all the sort of state transfer aspect of your application, but also you can simplify the way you do client side state management. So as a developer experience, it's just really attractive to be able to say, you just basically have the data that you need locally. You don't have to code across this kind of network bridge where you then have to have all these sort of layers to kind of cope with the problems of going across the network. And there's another key point, which is just about the benefits of moving the compute onto the local device. And I'll return to that a bit more in a sec. So, I mean, that's sort of me generally talking about kind of benefits of local first to say developers and companies, um, but we're also like, we're a startup. Um, and so I, I spend a bunch of time also talking to investors. And these are people who are watching the software space and they're looking at how it's changing. And they're trying to understand kind of how these trends play out. And, and so sort of what we and they are seeing is an evolution of the application stack 
So like what you have here in a picture is like the traditional architecture of backend services. You have this sort of imperative state transfer layer. And what we're seeing is that this is moving to a new stack where actually you get a kind of integration of a bunch of related trends. So, so first of all, you have this switch from like backend services and uh, web service APIs to uh, to sync engines, and that allows you to move to this local first architecture. You, with that, you obviously lose the back end in the stack. And so a bunch of that logic goes into the client, but in some cases you need logic to be run in say a more trusted environment. And so that tends to move to event sourcing handlers that are hung off the database. And it's interesting that there's a bunch of stuff happening there where what previously might've been sort of uh, functions or kind of Kafka, is moving into more of like a durable execution platform. So things like kind of ingest and temporal. And there's a very nice fit between the declarative nature of a sync engine architecture and a kind of declarative nature of this sort of the way that these durable execution platforms run code. And so a lot of what we've sort of seen in this like evolution of the way you do software development is about this move from imperative to declarative. And also just in the database layer, Sorry, if the word, I don't know if you can read it okay, but it's interesting that there's a bunch of moves for the database to become more of a platform because you often want to run the compute kind of close to the data. So instead of taking data out of the database and then doing stuff with it, you're sort of moving the compute into the database. And so in Postgres world, you've had stuff like all the cloud managed Postgres, like Aurora, you've got like serverless stuff like Neon, you've got kind of back end as a service platforms like say Superbase. But you've also got like a bunch of new platforms coming along. So things like Nile, Omnigres, uh, Tembo, where they're all sort of turning the database into more of a platform. So in a way, all these things kind of uh, fit together. But then, of course, you have like the, the main thing that is changing software right now. So the elephant in the room. And by that, I don't mean this elephant. And I don't mean this elephant I'm talking about. AI, right? And so this was like the title of the talk here about talking about local first AI. Because if you're focusing on how software is changing, it's getting smarter, right? And people are building AI into their applications and particularly integrating these type of large language model capabilities. And so, I mean, just to load up on it, right? What, what are people doing with AI? So you're building these kind of chat interfaces, talking to models. You have like similarity vector search. So this is an example of Spotify, how like they're changing their navigation based on vector search to find music. I think that's a lot of what may kind of first happen in applications. There's a move from more structured kind of point, like point and click and navigate interfaces through to stuff that's just more sort of fuzzy and sort of uh, assisted. And you have a bunch of sort of simple things like auto suggest, like this here you have like um, uh, Gmail where it's kind of suggesting replies or you have like Grammarly, you have kind of uh, systems that are sort of suggesting kind of actions or things that you might want to say. You have summarization. So this is an example of like some meeting kind of software and on the right hand side, you just get the AI summarizing the meeting. Um, it was quite funny. I was on a call with an investor yesterday and they, they would start off bringing on their kind of AI bots into the meetings. Uh, and I dropped off because my internet dropped and I rejoined the meeting. And because I dropped off their AI bot summarized what it had thought of me in the earlier part of the meeting. Um, so, but basically this kind of summarization is, is something that kind of is a very common use case at the moment. Then you have this sort of co-pilot kind of uh, stuff where large language models are very powerful, but also they're not perfect and they get confused and they hallucinate. Um, and so you have a lot of these applications where the pattern is it's sort of like generating something for you, but you then come along and kind of maybe fine tune it to make sure it's correct. And obviously coding is just a kind of key one here. And this is from like uh, console.dev. And then you have more of the sort of promise of the future of these sort of AI agents and kind of uh, assistance being built into the software. So there's a lot of stuff happening in like, um, uh, kind of lead generation and sales where people are deploying these kind of slightly spam agents out onto the internet. And so kind of <laughs> whatever you think about this stuff, and I, I imagine most of us here probably think that these kind of sales agents can go and burn in hell. Um, 
but it, it is unarguable that AI is a big part of where software is going. It is kind of like digitization mark two. And so if you're looking at local first and you're thinking, right, let's change the way people build software, like you have to look into going, well, actually, like how does local first fit into the way in which people are adding AI capabilities into their applications? Um, and so that's stuff that we've sort of dug into with electric. And if you, if you just sort of go to the basics and go, right, well, how do you integrate AI into your software apps? It, it kind of started with like calling the open AI API or hitting sort of chat GPT. You have these big companies like Microsoft or Google running models in the cloud and you kind of call them by API. And that's how we generate our silly elephant pictures. But then if you're moving to more serious applications as both say consumer applications or kind of business applications, you, you run up against problems just throwing your data into somebody else's cloud API. So for consumer applications, you have data privacy. If it's your business systems, you have like data security. And so there's a big, big trend at the moment, which is companies all moving to stand up their own LLM services in their own private infrastructure, particularly so that they can remain in control of their own data security. But then this is where one of the really interesting differences between like AI software and traditional software comes in because these AI services just cost a huge amount more to run. So if you think about it, it takes about a second to service an inference request. And that's even using these kind of um, like expensive kind of cloud specialist processors. So it's literally something like 300 trillion compute cycles. And it's like a million times more than a normal request, which should be like, you know, a millisecond or something. And so it's, it, it, it's like a thousand times more expensive to run these type of services than to run traditional software. And so just because of that kind of uh, cost concern, what's actually happening is that a lot of the big companies are trying to move to a model, which is very interesting to us, where they're running the AI locally on the user's device. Because instead of hosting these LLM models in your cloud, where you have to pay for, pay for the inference cost, if you run the model on the local device, then there is no cost. And so it can just eliminate this massive cost of standing up these applications. Uh, and if you think about something like a consumer app, like maybe for a business application or something, and you have a thousand users, it doesn't matter so much, but say you've got 20 million users and you're putting a customer, customer support agent in your app, the costs are just totally prohibitive. So unless you can run the AI locally, the economics of integrating this stuff just don't add up. And so kind of if you look at like, right, so how do you get this stuff to run locally on the device? You have the aspect of the chips. So you have companies like Apple and Intel are sort of scrambling to put neural processing units into all of your computers and your phones. You have the models where you have companies like Facebook and Google competing to create performant models that can run in like a sensible amount of memory and can be loaded in and out of processes quickly and run inference fast on device. So you have stuff like this week, Google just released Gemma, which is like a smaller open version of Gemini, their sort of chat GPT competitor. And then you have this aspect of the data because also what's happening with these more serious LLM applications is that they're feeding data into the model using techniques like retrieval augmented generation or RAG. And they're using RAG because it addresses the factuality problem with uh, hallucinations, kind of models making stuff up. And importantly, because then it allows you the models to access fresh data that wasn't in the training set. So you can make an AI system that knows about like today's share prices, your sales AI knows about your CRM system, your coding assistant can know about your private repos. But then of course, if you're running the AI locally on device, and you have that data in the cloud, you've got this big gap where you go, well, how do you get the data locally onto the device? And so if you're looking at that in terms of sort of architecting these new AI enabled applications, you're not gonna build that on like yesterday's architecture, you're gonna build that on this kind of sync engine architecture, which is the way that things are going. And so what we see then is an opportunity to uh, integrate the kind of local first sync engine that we have to provide uh, data to the local AI with this kind of liveness and freshness. And it's 
in a way, it's a really nice kind of driver for a local first architecture where you actually have to have the data on device in order to be able to feed it into the models, which you have these external economic drivers to be able to run on device. And so sort of digging into this has then led us down some quite cool avenues. Like one is that because we start with Postgres is integrating embeddings into the relational data model. So specifically using PG vector. And certainly for me, it was a kind of real light bulb moment where you go, it's just a foreign key relationship between like your main data and your kind of embeddings. It's like a full text search index maybe. And so you don't have to have like one system, which is sort of traditional structured data and another sort of vector database system to run AI. You can integrate both of these things into the same real time reactive data model. But then of course that raises the question of how do you get Postgres to run in the client locally? And so we've taken two approaches to that. One is using Tauri, which I'll just show you in a sec. And then the other one is using WASM. So you may be familiar with some of the previous experiments around running Postgres in the client. So you've had like Crunchy and Snaplet and Superbase have done some cool stuff with like uh, kind of putting Postgres in a VM inside WASM. But basically they're quite big. It was like a 32 meg download. There was a bunch of overhead about running within the VM. Um, and so what we've been able to do is building on a repo that originally the Neon team shared with us is to make a new project that's called PG Lite. And so we just uh, did an early, early launch of this last week. So it's a pure WASM builder Postgres. There's no VM. It's a 3.7 megabyte download. It runs in the browser and kind of node bar and other JavaScript environments with persistence. And you have the potential to compile extensions into it. So through this, you can get PG vector into the client and you can do this hybrid vector relational sync between server side and client side. And then the other approach that we've taken is putting Postgres with PG vector in the back end of a Tauri application. So Tauri is like a super cool desktop and mobile app packaging system. It's a very cool way of building local first applications. And what's nice about the architecture is it has the it has like a web view front end and then it has a Rust back end. And that's quite cool because you can kind of run whatever you want in the Rust back end. And then you have this kind of messaging bridge from your kind of front end web application to talk to it. And so we put Postgres with PG Vector in the back end of the Tauri app with Fast Embed, which is a vectorization library and Olama. So a 7 billion parameter open source model and we built what is basically a fully open source local AI stack using electric as the sync layer to get data onto the device to run local rag. Um, so I'll just jump into that now. Um, Sam, you'll have to forgive me that I'm going to talk over your demo here. Um, so this is just Sam just sort of walking through. We've taken our linear light example, which is one of our demo apps with electric. And then we've basically integrated this stack into it. So what you're seeing here is actually two towery applications side by side. Uh, on the right hand side of the screen here is the is just the architecture of the system that's actually going on so the first thing here is sam is just like entering in uh, an issue kind of as normal that goes into the relational data model it syncs between the two devices you, you you have all of the kind of usual kind of local first experience but then what we then do is we have some triggers that then call fast embed to generate vector embeddings based upon the content in the issue and so as well as the normal search in the application we've added a vector search and that allows you to then come in and enter like a, a term that's kind of similar and you're running vector search just within the local application as a way of kind of uh, providing a different form of navigation but then what's important is that vector search is then a key step in this kind of retrieval step for these rag applications so now we're going to go in and open up the chat interface to the llama model ask it a question about the same topic which is about like html forms and then it does that vector search, feeds that in as the context of the model, and then it returns the information that you've just literally entered into the database. So in this way, you get this kind of uh, live collaborative uh, stuff integrated in with the kind of LLM capabilities, all just running locally on device. So you don't send the prompt and you don't send the context data to the cloud. Everything can just function locally without the network if you wanted to. So, um, so Sam's here, and uh, this was kind of mainly his work that I'm talking about, and it's super cool. Um, and he's going to be available in the Q and A if you kind of want to dig into any of the technical details, um, and also just on the chat now. 
I'll just finish up by going, like if we just zoom back out for a moment, what I wanted to show with this is that local first has like a software architecture, isn't just relevant for apps like say Figma or Linear, like in a way, it isn't just the best way of building the types of applications that we have been building in the past. It's actually also the best way of building the software that we're going to be building in the future, where you can integrate this kind of like structured interactive applications with this sort of new world of AI and other trends in software development, and particularly around this pattern of like a hybrid, like vector and sort of structured, like in our case, relational data model. And a lot of it obviously still remains to be defined and built, right? And there's, there's just like, these are all kind of early experiments. Um, and if you're interested, we'd love to collaborate with you on the journey. Like we're here in the LoFi Discord. We, we have our own Discord. You can find on the website, Electric SQL. Um, and I was also going to <laughs> mention the Local First conference. Um, so this is the, it's the continuation of the Local First meetup in Berlin that Johannes organized last year. Uh, there are going to be some really great speakers. It's a sort of broad spectrum of like app builders, framework builders, thought leaders, researchers, but also particularly like companies that are actually running local first in production. Um, there's one day of like uh, speakers. There's going to be like 10 really good talks. Then there's going to be a workshop day on the next day. Uh, there's only 150 tickets. They went on sale today. So it's a great time to go and snap up an early bird one whilst they're still on offer. Um, and it's early summer, Berlin. It's going to be great. So I uh, hope, hope to see you there. Amazing talk, James. Uh, and again, this is why I love everything you guys are doing. It's always cutting edge. Uh, I feel like I just had a master class on in device AI. Uh, next up, uh, this is kind of weird to introduce myself, but it's me and Kyle uh, giving the next talk. Kyle's somebody that I deeply respect. Uh, if he's basically a household name. Uh, if you haven't learned something about JavaScript from Kyle, you probably haven't read one of his books then, but uh, he's critically acclaimed and one of the best people that, surprise announcement that I am now proud to call as a co-founder, we're joining forces to keep things moving forward and re-envision the world we're in today. Uh, so I got a little bit of a deck for you guys. All right. So the let me start by mo by sort of listing out the motivation for the talk and who it's mainly geared towards. Through our community, we have exposure to some of the challenges people face, and personally, I've had to try and build a local first authentication scheme and have run into pitfall after pitfall. And one of the things that happens is that you build a local app, you have all these aspirations because you've bought into what the lo-fi world offers, but you get to a stage where you try to fulfill your requirements and you're met with all sorts of challenges. What do I mean by that? Uh, first, I want to be able to log in, whether it's a mobile app or a web page. It needs to be able to log in offline because the app should work offline. It should completely work without any servers from start to finish, and you want it to be encrypted at rest. And we're trying to focus on what's the bare minimum amount of things you need to be able to get an app up and running through in a local first stack. Uh, the Next thing that happens, like, great, all right, I bought in, let me do some crypto things, and you'll be met with a very uninviting crypto jungle. Uh, if you just finding a library was already challenging enough, we strongly recommend Libsodium. Uh, if you're just doing in the browser, you can settle for crypto uh, that is being that is being jammed in from the web browser APIs. So they call it the subtle uh, S-U-B-T-L-E. You can access a bunch of these functionalities, but even then you might have some challenges trying to decide what should be done and how you should do it. Kyle will talk more about this, but the one thing I would stress is make sure you have a random, uh, strong random generator to create your initializing vector. From there, you can hash and then generate keys and then encrypt it. I'm blazing past that because we have an awesome session with Kyle coming up next. 
you might be wondering, okay, there's a lot of products out there. We have a lot of login solutions. Why wouldn't one of these solutions work per se? And this is sort of a brief overview. I have a couple more deck slides, but we can do that in the open uh, in the Q&A section. First one is encrypting with biometrics on device so that your app just has a touch ID and you log in. This gets a little bit challenging if you're going to go to multi-device. And then if you end up having a key that you encrypt with locally and then you unlock with touch ID, you're essentially keeping your keys and your data sort of in the same place. And you don't want to make them, you don't want keys and encrypted data to be neighbors because that's sort of obfuscation. WebAuthn and passkeys were really exciting until you delve in and you find that there needs to be some external party that needs to store your initial public key so that it can challenge it to authenticate you. Uh, OpenID and OAuth could work if you're ready to lax your session time. What I mean by that is there's this Web3 auth company that allows you to sign in with your socials and it will return back your private key and public key. This is sort of interesting in that your app can now just do social signing every time you go in and you can take keys to encrypt, decrypt, generate signing keys or sync keys. You can do whatever you want. But unfortunately, what you're left with is that you won't be able to log in without the servers like Google or Facebook or whatever social login you used. You'll need to deploy the app's private OAuth key into the client application, which is not a trusted environment. And sign in with Ethereum is a session based one, so it can approve the session, but you really can't use sign in with Ethereum to fetch your private key. All in all, what I'm trying to get at is that we have a lot of solutions out there. The challenge is that all of these had their own problems that they were meant to solve. And the solutions end up focusing on being able to deliver an authenticated yes answer. Then it is about giving you keys that you can then use to decrypt your local data. So we have some ideas around that. And Kyle will talk to you about how to actually do that as a demo. And then we'll tell you some of the things we have in, in the works. Over to you, Kyle. Um, okay, so um, the thing that Jans and I were talking about when he asked me to join up was we want to build this app, but we do not want to require there to be some centralized server that stores the authentication information. That is the accounts that people have, um, you know, their credentials and all of that. We don't want all of that stuff. Well, okay, there's, as Jan said, there's tons of providers of that kind of authentication stuff, but they all have their own servers. So we could be talking about Google, we could be talking about your Apple ID, we could be talking about any of a variety of other federated account management. One of my favorites for years was to just build apps on top of the GitHub uh, account system. So if you have a GitHub account, you can log in and do whatever you want in an app and just use GitHub instead of, uh, you know, building up your own username and password databases and all of that. But I think all of us can agree that none of those solutions really encompass what it means to be local first, especially as Martin so eloquently laid out um, earlier, when you have to rely upon uh, those other uh, systems, unfortunately, those can go down, they can have outages, they can start charging for things. They're just not reliable systems for authentication. So what we started talking about is what would a local first approach to identity and identity management and authentication, what would that look like? And we've, went, we've gone around in circles a variety of times. We built this very, very simple and rough PWA demo to show some of the early ideas that we have. But I'm just going to go ahead and short circuit to saying uh, this is not the final form of what we want to create. What we are intending to create is essentially a wallet system for the lo-fi identity uh, mechanism and for anyone in the lo-fi uh, community who would like to build apps around that to be able to, to 
let users with their own wallets manage their own identities on their own devices, synchronize between their devices, and then your apps can do whatever you want. Your apps can be the, the, the local only style of apps. They can be the local first with cloud or peer to peer using any of the synchronization protocols that Martin talked about using electric SQL, like, like Sam and James talked about, or any of the other great ones that this community has built. Uh, what we wanted to do was how do I create an identity for myself that can be portable between apps and between my own devices. And so what we have here, um, Jans, if you want to click on the register button and I'll talk through what's going to happen here, we're going to pick a name. So you pick Jans, sure, and click create and then go ahead and put in your name and your email. We've got some CSS styling <laughs> issues right before the demo went live, but there we go. So what's going to happen now is that we've displayed a list of 24 words. So what is that? Um, you might have seen this kind of thing before. Um, there is a protocol for generating from a word list uh, this sort of unique identity. It's basically the initialization vector, the randomized bits used to generate an elliptic curve key. And um, this code is using the standard actually from the Bitcoin protocol. It's called BIP39. So we generate a random set of bits and then we turn those bits through an algorithm into a word list. Now, if Jans were to copy that word list into his clipboard and then once he clicks log in, he can log out and log back in. So let's just do that, Jans. We're in, we're logged in, but immediately click the log out. Well, he's going to add a note, but click the log out. And then when we go back to log in, and he selects that profile and pastes that same word list back in, the app lets him back in, the demo app lets him back in. Now what you're not seeing under the cover is we don't have developer tools open, but all of the data, the registration data, the notes data in this demo, all of that is being encrypted by that identity that is represented by that word list. So you might start to ask, well, how's that word list any different than a user just providing their own passwords? And you may have heard that passwords can be hashed into encryption and decryption keys, and that's true. The problem is that user provided passwords, as we all know, are terrible. They are not long enough. They do not have enough entropy in them. So they don't represent a good source of randomness for hashing in to create a key. And this word list is true randomized bits and uh, just the word representation of it. So a user could, in theory, manage their own identities across their own devices doing exactly what I just described, doing copying and pasting their unique word list and using that across their devices. What we wanted to do was actually start to reduce some of the friction of that because once I do it on one device, the very next question I have is, how do I do that on my phone or how do I do that on my tablet? And we want to reduce that friction. And that is eventually what will get rolled into a wallet app. That's our intent. But for now, it's just in this app. So what we're going to do is if you click the provide sync button there, uh, Jans. Yeah. Do we want crowds to jump in on this as well? Or? Yeah, I'm going to tell everybody in just a minute, but just click the provide sync. Okay, now everybody uh, maybe close your developer tools so that everybody can see the full QR code that's happening there. What's happening here is what's sometimes referred to as an animated QR code. Um, but what this is, is just a series of QR codes that are being generated and sync, uh, you know, shown through serially. If any of the rest of you that have the demo open, go to the receive sync, it will open up your camera on your device. And if you try to scan that QR code, you should see Jans's account pop into your device because this is including both the credentials and the data. And so what's happening here is we're just taking the big, uh, you know, set of your account data in a string form, breaking that up into QR codes and displaying them by frames. And then we're having a reader on the other side that reads it. Now, there's lots of different ways that you can transfer data between devices. This just happened to be one choice that we made. Obviously, there's Bluetooth, there's uh, other peer-to-peer -peer networking protocols that are in progress, and there's even more interesting demos, like, for example, using sound and things like that. 
But basically what we're talking about is that we want to make it as easy as possible for a user with their set of credentials and information on one device. And by the way, that doesn't necessarily need to include the account data of an app. It's just who I am and how I'm referred to across the network. That's what we're talking about. We want to make that so I can take that with me onto all of my devices. And we don't make a lot of changes to those credentials. So we, we just want to reduce that friction enough that I can hold up my phone to my laptop and scan in a frame and in a few seconds be synced or make a Bluetooth connection between the two, etc. Once I have my wallet synchronized across as many of my devices as I want, we then need to make it very easy for you to use your account identity to get into an app that's built around that authentication system. So what Jans and I are doing with our startup is building the first app that will use the LoFi ID wallet uh, concept, but we're hoping lots of other people um, w in this community will want to get behind that. It's very early, so if you have thoughts on what you would need the identity to include, um, effectively at the at the lowest level, it's simply a key pair. It's a public-private key in the encryption scheme that represents you your public key is actually what represents you on the network and your private key allows you to uh, decrypt information that's sent to you so we are encrypting locally uh, and we would recommend all other lo-fi identity based apps would encrypt locally but of course that would be up to you you could simply take somebody's key and have a challenge that lets you know who they are and you could forgo doing the local encryption if you didn't want to but i think encryption at rest is a better default to go toward so what we're going to be doing is creating this wallet app and creating a set of libraries that will be very easy for you to integrate your application without writing your own synchronization code or anything else like that. You'll be able to take somebody's portable identity from their wallet and authenticate them into your app and then do whatever your app does great from there. And that's the vision of what we're working on next. So over the next few months, we plan to be rolling some of that out. Any of you here in the community that are interested in this space and would like to participate or maybe be an early adopter or just give us feedback on what you think those identity management needs, definitely speak up. We're interested. Um, I will throw it back to Jans now. Yeah, I can't stress enough the need for people's collaboration. Like, we're not trying to push an auth company or anything. We're not even remotely interested in, we weren't even interested in building this because it didn't exist and it keeps coming up as one of the hurdles for people getting up and running a local first that we are incubating this as part of the platform that we're building. Uh, we, for what we're building, we're not really sharing the information yet uh, if anybody's interested in waiting to hear once we're ready to launch i will drop in our twitter in the chat uh, basically the idea is that with a reusable identity and a shared data substrate we can create a, a moat and a leverage for local first applications that can grow to challenge any of the experiences you have with the web two companies so it's like single sign-on meets privacy expectations without needing to re start from scratch and log in and sign up on every new platform that we use basically we call that the substrate we'll share more in the future but first, we want to solve the problem of getting up and running with your own local first app with this identity solution. So give us your input, your feedback, and we'll also create a private channel for people who want to help build this out. Before just, we run, if I, yeah, if I could ahead. hop in real quick, um, I, I, some people I'm seeing in the chat didn't really get it from before. So I'm going to try this one more time through my little camera here. If you have the app open and you want to try the receive sync to read some QR codes, I'm going to hold this up to my camera and we'll see if any of you are able to synchronize this identity from my phone onto your device. That may or may not work. We'll see, but I'll just hold that there for a few seconds and see if anyone's able. I can share the I can share mine too if anybody wants it. Here, what do I do with the big screen version of it? I was able to sync it, uh, Jans. Okay. Good. At least one person was able to benefit it was, from 
It was just a little tricky to um, get it aligned right in the square. No, it's um, a little, little janky. So Could this is my question. Then? I'm asking to sync, and oh. then I go, and then I sync it. It's reading, reading, and shows. Do you accept? Yes, and this was the app we created. I don't know if you can see it, but anybody who wants to snipe that, uh, go for it. Uh, the demo gods were not happy with us today, but that's all right. This was sort of, let's show you what's possible kind of demo for what we're trying to build. Uh, but on the next session, we'll have something even more buttoned up. I've dropped the Twitter link for what we're working on, but we'll share that once we're ready to start telling people more. But before we run, we have one last announcement. And what? Oh, I was going to ask a question about the talk, but we could do that instead. I can ask the question in the chat. <laughs> OK, yeah, we'll do Q&A right after your announcement. All right, great. Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Peter Van Hardenberg. I'm at Ink and Switch. I'm part of the Auto Merge team. Um, Jans and I were talking about how we can help this community grow and build more awesome stuff. And uh, I suggested that folks like the Auto Merge community and hopefully other groups like Electric and so on uh, can host build days. And so we're going to try and host the first one. It's going to be an experiment. Uh, basically, uh, some of the folks from the AutoMerge community are going to come here. We're going to do like a getting started building apps with AutoMerge session. We're going to show you how to build an app, talk you through the basics, answer your questions, and then stick around uh, for a while afterwards, for a few hours, and just sort of like answer questions, help figure out if people are running into trouble. And uh, I'm really excited. Uh, I think. You know, there's so much great technology and so many great ideas sort of fermenting in this community right now. And uh, bringing all of this stuff out to folks who are not library authors in new ways is, I think, a great way to get progress. I'm really looking forward not just to seeing what you build, but also to all of the documentation improvements I'm sure we will uh, ship as a result of that session, both preparing for it and, uh, and also going through it with you all. Uh, and that's going to be March 19th, right? Yep, March yep. 19th, uh, and I don't think we've set the start time yet. I think uh, probably 9 a.m. West Coast, which I think is 1700 London, 1800 CET, if you are Central European. And uh, if you are in uh, Australia, New Zealand, or Japan, India, places like that, I'm sorry. Uh, you can uh, always join the AutoMerge Discord as well and ask your questions there. Um, really, oh, really looking forward to it and I can't wait to see who else uh, hosts one because I can't wait to come and try your stuff as well alright that's mm -hmm. it looking forward to seeing you all there wonderful uh, that is it for LoFi 12 we're incredibly grateful to our speakers the wonderful community whose energy keeps me excited and more optimistic for the future than the path that we're on today um, thank you, Peter and Ink and Switch team, for opting in to do Build Day. Well, like uh, Auto Merge is a little, it's one of the more exciting technologies, and being able to have support delving into the tricky concepts will go a long way to making local first accessible. Which is, if you had to take one thing away, the future is local first, and we're doing our best to make it accessible so everybody can build products. I'm going to stop this stream and recording now, and then we can start our Q&A. And thank you again.